So this week's lecture is on perception development, where we'll focus on sensation and perception in the early infancy. So let's get started. So please take a look at the chapter objectives before you even begin this lecture. This is a way for you to kind of set up um, a framework in your mind of what to expect this lecture to be about. And this would also be a really good slide or information to come back to after you've completed the lecture, just so you can test your comprehension and make sure you haven't left out anything. Start from the left of this image. Imagine yourself to be a baby seeing this object for the first time. So without much interpretation, how might you experience or quote unquote sense what's in front of you? For example, if you closed your eyes, what might you smell or hear? And then if you opened your eyes, what might you see? What might you feel if you touched it or played with it? What might you taste if you ate it or bit on it? The process of taking in raw sensation information is what we call sensation. And after these information get to the brain, and we use what's in the brain to make sense of it, like the middle image, that process of giving meaning is called perception. So this is the age all nature versus nurture debate. The nativist perspective or nurture side of things, they argue that perceptual skills are innate. And this is supported by research that shows a variety of skills are already present in newborns or very young infants, suggesting that innate factors are more important than environmental factors. The opposite argument, empiricism or the nurture side of things, it takes the view that perceptual skills are learned and animal research shows that at least some minimum level of experience is needed to support the development of perceptual systems. Now, most developmentalists agree that perceptual development is the result of the interaction between inborn and experiential factors. An example of this would be a newborn baby's ability to discriminate between her mother's face from a very familiar um, woman's face, like grandma's. The familiarity with the mother's face must be the result of experience, and yet that capacity to make the distinguish um, between mother's face and grandma's face must be built in. Now, how do we go about answering the nature and nurture questions related to sensation and perception? Who do we study? How do we study this population? Or what methods do we use to study these two topics in particular? As you might have guessed from this video, researchers tend to study babies. There are three basic methods we can use to explore infants' experiences. The first one is the preference technique. This is where the researchers determine whether many babies shown the same pair of pictures consistently look longer at one picture versus another. This would indicate whether the babies notice the differences between the two pictures and whether certain types of objects or pictures capture the baby's attention more than others. The second process is called the process of habituation and dishabituation. This is where a baby is first presented with a particular sight or sound over and over again until he habituates to it, gets used to it, or until he loses interest to it, essentially. Then another sight or sound or object that's slightly different from the original one is presented to the baby. The researcher then measures whether the baby shows renewed interest. If he does, that's proof for dishabituation. That means the baby perceives some kind of change, that's why he's interested in it. In the next slide, there'll be a YouTube video to help you see what this looks like in real life. A third option of studying babies would be using the principle of operant conditioning, which we talked about in chapter one. This is an example of where babies might be trained to turn her head when she hears a particular sound, and then using a sight of an interesting moving toy as reinforcement to establish this movement. 
then after this learned response is established, the experimenter can vary the sound in some systematic way to see whether or not the baby still turns her head. Now that we know who and how to study, why do you think we often study babies for the topic of sensation and perception in terms instead of other population? In the next few slides, we'll explore early sensory skills in infants. This is where we're simply asking what information the sensory organs perceive, so we're not yet to the meaning-making process yet. They'll ask questions such as, does the structure of the eye permit infants to see color? Are the structures of the ear and the cortex designed in a way that very young infants can discriminate between different pitches? So the conclusion would be, Newborns and young infants have far more sensory capacity than physicians and psychologists once thought. This is possibly because babies were born with relatively poor level of motor skills that we might have assumed their sensory skills are equally poor. You'll see in the next couple of slides how this is really not the case. So let's talk about vision development in infants in the first year. First, visual acuity is the concept that refers to how well one can see. At birth, an infant's visual acuity is between the range of 2200 to 2400. So let's translate that back to English. If you're 2200, this means you can see at 20 feet what an average person can see at 200 feet. So compared to quote-unquote normal visual acuity of 2020, which we hear often, this is where you can see at 20 feet what an average person can see at 20 feet. So in other words, the higher the second number, or the denominator is, the poorer someone's vision is. As you can see in the slide, an infant's visual acuity improved pretty rapidly during the first year as a result of all the swift changes that occurs within the brain and their experiences. And by six months, an infant's visual acuity is already about 20-20. And in terms of colors, we know that babies have the type of cells to perceive red and green at least at one month and perhaps even earlier. And this probably applies to the color blue as well. So another significant vision growth during the first year is an infant's ability to follow moving object. This is especially important as the baby has relatively little ability to move or control his or her body at this point. So baby's ability to scan and track moving object improves as the eye movement becomes under voluntary control. And this process is called tracking. So the red line you can see in each figure shows a trajectory of the moving line the baby is trying to follow with their eyes in Aslan's experiment. The black line represents one baby's eye movement at six weeks and then again at 10 weeks. So you can see at six weeks, the baby is more or less able to follow the line, but not smoothly. Around 10 weeks, that same exact baby's tracking skills has remarkably become smoother and more accurate. And what researchers have found about tracking skills before six weeks is um, there's some ability to track only if the object is moving slowly and only for a brief period. So you can see how remarkable some of these skills develop even within a short period of time. In terms of hearing, infants' auditory skills are far more superior than their vision at birth. They can hear almost the same as adults do in terms of general pitches and loudness, with the exception of high-pitched sounds, which they need to hear at a higher volume. Their ability to detect the location of sound is present at birth and improves pretty rapidly with age, reaches adult level around two years of age. So looking at the auditory milestones on this slide within the first year, it's pretty remarkable how much a little human being grows within a short time. So for one month old, they can distinguish between pa and ba, 
Up to six months, baby can discriminate all sounds and contrasts that appear in any languages, include the language that they do not hear spoken around them. So all this we'll kind of revisit again when we talk about language development. But something I wanted to mention now is this is why a lot of times people would advocate for exposure to different sounds at an early age because that ability to differentiate between different sounds disappear by about 12 months of age. So if you think about it, it's good to expose baby to different music, different languages, and just different tones of sound to sharpen their listening and potentially their language skills. So an additional resource I want to point you to is a handout called Perception in Infancy, which you can find under the additional resources folder um, for this chapter on Blackboard. And I'll give you much more details on um, what we know about the baby's senses and perceptual development. Here, I'll just give you a quick overview on some of them before we move on. So let's talk about touch. It's one of the first senses to develop in the womb. It's said as early as five weeks in the womb, babies have developed that sense, and it's possibly the most advanced once they're born. Babies tend to be the most sensitive in their mouth, which makes sense when you think about this is how they feed and tend to explore the world as babies and toddlers through chewing, biting. And babies tend to thrive on a lot of physical contact through a lot of physical touches, which makes them feel cozy, loved, and secure. So people have said more than any other touches, uh, more than any other senses, touch really ensures the bonding between a parent and a baby. So next we'll talk about their sense of smell. Babies develop the ability to smell in utero when mom is around six months pregnant. In fact, this sense actually isn't, I mean it's developed at birth, but it dramatically increases from birth to age eight when the child's power of odor detection will become better than most adults. So just within that span of eight years, um, they actually become quite mature in their ability to smell. And again, similar to touch, the baby uses the sense to explore the world, gets to know mom. So mom, um, mom's scent and the unique scent of the breast milk, that's something the baby can detect before he or she reaches one week old, which is pretty remarkable. And similar to what we've talked about in previous chapter, girls tend to be more sensitive to touch than smells than most, most boys, which researchers have attributed to sex hormones of testosterone decreasing and estrogen increasing, which makes um, girls or females more sensitive um, to a lot of physical smells and touches. So similar to touch and taste, the baby's taste buds are also developed in utero. And this is because she's exposed to the mother's diet through the amniotic fluid. And not only during pregnancy, even after birth, mom will continue to share flavors with the baby after birth, especially if the mom's breastfeeding. The food also passes through the breast milk. And depending on what mom eats, the breast milk just tastes a little different each time based on the food. However, no matter what mom eats or um, during the first couple of months of motherhood if mom is breastfeeding, the baby is born with a sweet tooth. So anything sugary is yummy and soothing. So that's why babies tend to gulp up breast milk and formula since both are very sweet. You can say this is nature's way of providing the perfect food for babies. And here you can see babies can taste these five main tastes at a pretty early age, either at birth, shortly after, or within the first year. Do you want to guess which out of these five tastes babies can't really taste until four months of age? You can probably guess from that little picture full of baby um, expressions. Babies actually don't develop um, salt appreciation until four months of age. And this actually makes sense on an evolutionary survival perspective of babies can't really digest and consume a lot of sodium. So it makes sense for them to not have developed that taste because very little sodium is found in breast milk. So how exactly do infants perceive the world? One very important concept is called intermodal perception. 
This is where newborn infants do not just use one sense exclusively, but they expect sight, sound, and touch to go together from the very beginning of life. So in the next few slides, we'll talk about concepts of perceptual constancy and depth perception before we move on to the last part, which is where we talk about infants perceiving social signals and emotional expressions. So in order for babies to make sense of what they see into a single coherent representation, so going from senses into perception, they must acquire a set of rules, and these are called perceptual constancies. So the first of these rules is size constancy. This is where babies begin to understand the same object can look very different. And this is something they master very early on. They recognize that an object remains the same size despite its distance from the observer. So the two pictures on this slide would be examples of size constancy, that you understand despite how they look different, they're the same object. Second rule is called shape constancy. This is where babies develop the perception that an object's shape is stable despite the changes in the shape projected onto the retina. You can see that through the image here of the door is still a door despite the angle that it's presented. So both the shape and size constancies are present in two to three months old babies. So that's pretty early on in life. Third rule, color constancy. This is referring to the ability to recognize that colors are constant even though the amount of light or shadow on them changes. So combining color constancy with the two previous rules, these three specific constancies add up to a larger concept called object constancy. This is where babies recognize that object remain the same even though the sensory information about them has changed in some way. Next, we'll talk about depth perception. Can infants process sensory information accurately? This was a question posed by Walk and Gibson in 1960s when they first conducted something called the Visual Cliff Experiment. You've probably heard of this. This was designed to provide an illusion of a sudden drop between a horizontal surface and another. So in the next slide, there's a video to show you how this study looks like in reality and how it relates to depth perception. Infants are particularly interested in looking at human faces, but tend to focus on different areas of the face depending on their age. At birth, infants are said to be attracted to the border of the face, so the periphery. So when looking at human faces, a newborn will pay much more attention to the hairline or to the edge of the face, even though the human newborn can't see all the features of the face. By two months of age, infants begin to attend to the more internal features of the face, such as the nose and the mouth. By three months of age, what researchers have found is that infants almost focus entirely on the interior of the face, particularly the eyes and the lips. And theorists believe infants might be more attracted to those parts because um, faces have stimuli that move, particularly in the eyes or the lips area. So they're attracted to that movement. They can track that, as we've previously said. And potentially because there's stimuli that's related to lighter and darker contrasts, um, the eyes, the lips, and the teeth. What's really interesting is by three months of age, infants can tell the difference between his or her mother's face and a stranger's face. So the last part of this lecture, we'll look at perception to social signals and emotional expression. Currently, what we know um, from research evidence is that infants begin to pay attention to social and emotional cues and faces at around two to three months of age. So beginning in very early infancy, children would look to their parents for cues on how to respond to various stimuli. This process of social referencing generally occurs in novel or startling or otherwise unfamiliar situations. 
And this is related to a section in your book called Infant's Response to Maternal Depression. And this is on page 130. This is where babies who interact regularly with mothers who have depression express more negative and fewer positive emotions. So there's a couple of hypotheses for this. Babies could react this way as a result of exposure to more depression-related hormones, either prenatally or via breastfeeding. However, you can also say because mothers who have um, depression tend to maybe exhibit more negative and fewer positive emotions when they're interacting with their human um, infants. Um, so you can say it's a matter of environmental effects as well. Good news though, these effects can be moderated if these mothers with depression can exhibit more sensitive parenting behavior. So these babies aren't doomed. So read more on 130 in your textbook just to find out more about um, infant's response to maternal depression and also how in general babies perceive social signals in the first year of life. In the next slide, there's a related video um, that you can watch just to get a better idea of what this looks like in reality. So for this last slide of this lecture, I'd like to invite you to think about this question of, do you think emotions are universal or are they culturally specific? or both. So to find out more, please read page 131 in your chapter. So this concludes the end of our lecture this week. Please let me know if you have any questions. Um, my tip would be, be sure to quiz yourself to see if you can answer all the chapter objectives before taking um, the RAQ for this week. Okay, so if you have any questions, I am available through email. I will see you all in class. Take care. Bye.